It's the dawn of the 1960s and you've just got back to your palace after a long day running your oil-rich empire. The post is brought to you and in it are two interesting brochures from a small sports car company in Italy. One, their latest racing car, which has already won everything but isn't a great deal of use to you to use on the road. But the other is a very pretty grand touring car. You toy with the idea, but then you ask yourself, what if a fellow ruler has something faster or even more exclusive? You think, I wonder what would happen if I put the engine from the racing car into the chassis of the road car. You'd create the ultimate sports car of the day. And that is how the Maserati 5000 GT was born. That first client was, of course, the Shah of Iran, known for his love of fast cars. And he always wanted to be the first man to have every motoring novelty. But others like him followed. Basil Reed, the owner of the Kayalami circuit in South Africa. Ferdinando Innocenti, who, of course, made cars, scooters, and scaffolding, another lover of great cars. Briggs Cunningham, Le Mans entrant, an American sportsman par excellence. It was a car that was targeted very much at kings, heads of state, playboys and leading industrialists, although very few could afford it. In the end, Maserati only made 34 of these cars, starting in 1960 and finishing around 1963. Although this was always a car that was made to order and no two were identical. The other famous owner, along with the Shah, was the spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslims, the Aga Khan a man who was said to receive his weight in gold every year from his followers, which probably helped to buy quite a few beautiful cars. The Aga Khan was a visionary. He's also the man who created the Costa Esmeralda, effectively. He broke the record for crossing the Atlantic in a boat, a record that still stands 30 years later. A man of great style, but also a man of discretion in relative terms. The two 5000 GTs that you see here are bodied by a little known carrozziere called Pietro Frua, who came from Turin, a, a brand that is long since gone, but to connoisseurs, a brand of great style and great quality. The car on the left was built for the Aga Khan to his bespoke order, even including a record player in the dashboard. The car on the right was built for the head of a pharmaceutical company in Rome, but then effectively remade as a new car for the exiled king of Saudi Arabia, King Ibn al Saud, living first in Greece and latterly in Egypt. After the king's demise, the car was effectively impounded by the Egyptian authorities because he had forgotten to pay import taxes on it. As a diplomat, one assumed that you didn't have to. The authorities obviously felt differently. The car sat in storage for decades until it was auctioned in 2000 I was in fact in charge of that auction and subsequently restored in the Modena area by none other than Giuseppe Candini, Mr. Maserati in this part of the world. Mio padre voleva che io studiassi, <laughs> però ho studiato un po', poca roba, però vicino a casa mia c'era un'officina. Invece quando venivo a casa da scuola invece andare, andare in questa officina e questa mi ha, mi ha rovinato. Quindi dopo da lì ho girato molto in diverse officine, tipo Stanguellini, Zucchimai, qualche officina importante. E poi dopo mi piacevano le macchine e sono riuscito a entrare in Maserati. Maserati è il tempo delle corse, andai a andai al reparto di, di assistenza clienti che facevano le vetture sport, eh, e lì ero ancora apprendista, 
mi divertivo, qualche volta mi portavano le corse e allora mi ero appassionato proprio. Mi ero appassionato ancora di più di quello che, che pensavo. Finito tutte le cose, sono andato militare, eh? dopo finito il militare, eh, si sono messo per conto mio con un socio che rimase diversi anni, poi dopo il signor De Tomaso una sera mi telefona a casa, che, era, che mi conosceva già, e, e mi disse Caldini, lei deve venire a Modena a aprire l'officina dell'assistenza dei clienti per i Maserati e tutte le Maserati che la concessionaria non era, non era l'altezza insomma. Lui mi fece venire a Modena, qui poi, e lì fece un gran lavoro, lì con il biturbo, feci tante macchine. Il Tommaso mi dava anche degli, degli operai la sera per svolgere il lavoro perché il problema era dell'assistenza dell del biturbo. E lì eh, mi è sempre piaciuto, anche lì ore e ore, la sera mai a casa, mia moglie sempre incavolata e poi dopo è venuto Marcello, Marcello è venuto con me e quindi siamo divertiti, mi diverto ancora, la mia dolce età e mi diverto ancora <ride> e mi dispiace mettere, smettere proprio. <ride> Comunque le Maserati quando uscì poi i 5.000, uscì il 3.500 che era una gran macchina e poi fecero questi 5.000 che li fecero a richiesta per dei personaggi molto importanti e lì io mi divertivo a vedere passare Guerino Bretocchi quando le provavo, mi mettevo sui viali e lui andava su, a San Damaso e andava a vedere i passaggi perché era una macchinotta che andava oltre 300 km all'ora allora faceva un po' effetto, faceva ne avrò visto uno, non so se era questo, questo o quella lì però cioè, non era che girassero tutti i giorni quelle lì. Eh. La macchina che eh, ho alle mie spalle, che è un 5000, è un progetto che noi abbiamo seguito eh, all'inizio degli anni 2000 e ci era stata presentata questa opportunità di riportare in auge un, un pezzo da 90, diciamo, della storia Maserati. E fu un progetto che ci venne <coughs> proposto dal dottor Orsi che noi accettammo molto volentieri perché come dicevo, è una, una macchina con un'importanza straordinaria per il marchio del Tridente. Let's have a look at this car together. It's full of details that you will not see on almost any other car. I can't take responsibility for the choice of music, but just the fact that you can play a record for your passenger beats Apple music hands down. The color was known as penombra metallizzato, metallic twilight. And you see at this time of the day, it's really starting to come alive. It changes in the different lights. There are hues of purple, blue, gray, of course, contrasting with this ivory leather interior and beautiful chrome fittings on the sides of the seat. And look at the way that it's pleated with a triangular shape in the middle and the very distinctive steering wheel with the spokes not horizontal but angled downwards and of course the 300 kilometer an hour speedometer which would have been the envy of any child or grown up 60 years ago. The Burgundy car was the first of the two to be built It was a show car and subsequently purchased by presumably the president of a large pharmaceutical company in Rome. The suede interior is possibly the most indulgent and least practical material you could trim a car with, but it makes for this incredibly luxurious and decadent feel. After the Rome company had finished with the car, it went back to Maserati, who effectively redesigned some of the details, the headlights, the front grille and other fittings and sold it as a new car to the exiled king of Saudi Arabia living at the time in uh, Egypt. That's when it was painted burgundy. Before that, it was Oro Longchamp, this beautiful, rich gold metallic. These two are the only two full fat 5000 GTs bodied by Frua. And as you can see, each is slightly different. But at the end of production, the Aga Khan's architect 
who had obviously admired his boss's car, asked for a similar looking car. By that stage, the stock of 5,000 GT engines had been finished. So he just got a regular Maserati V8 road car engine with slightly less horsepower, which was probably quite diplomatic when he turned up to see his boss in it. What do you think of the looks? To be fair, I think they divide opinion. They were pioneering at the time. This was before the Maserati Mistral and before the Maserati Quattroporte, which went on to be a great success as the company's first four-seater. You've got elements of all of those different cars in here. The front is very Quattroporte-esque. The side profile, where they've clearly tried to keep the waistline low to maximize the light inside the car, then has this kick up to the rear. Shades of the Maserati Mexico in here. Very much a Mistral-esque side profile. Much, much more elaborate detailing inside the car than any Maserati road car ever received afterwards. Bear in mind, there was absolutely no regard to cost when this was built at over $20,000. It was more than twice the price of the contemporary 3,500 GT, or indeed, let's say, the Ferrari 250 short wheelbase of the same era. They're pioneering. They're incredibly rare. To have both of them here today, I think it's probably the first time they've been together since 1962. To drive, well, you can be the judge when you see the video. You can tell from the moment you turn the key, though, that this is no ordinary road-going Maserati. And as my passenger earlier commented, when you, when you start the engine and you blip the throttle, the whole car twitches. It's almost like an AC Cobra with an Italian suit. cattive, eh? ci prendi la mano e, da, e ci dai del gas, lei spinge, eh? proprio eh, cattiva, cattiva.